Hi everyone and welcome to the 2017 Code Talk series. The 2017 Code Talk series is co-sponsored by ODTUG and IOUG and provided by Oracle Developer Advocates. Today's webinar is Unit Testing PL SQL Code in the Real World and will be presented by Stephen Feuerstein of Oracle Corporation with a panel of three developers. If you have any questions at any time during the webinar, please type them in the question box and they will be addressed by a member of the panel. This presentation will be recorded and will, will be available to everyone through the Code Talk page of the ODTUG website. So welcome, gentlemen, and thank you for being here today. Thank you, Karen, and thanks, ODTUG, for sponsoring and IOG as well. Hello, everybody. My name is Stephen Feuerstein. I'm the Oracle Developer Advocate for PL SQL and actually lead the team of Oracle Developer Advocates. We're evangelists to both promote our technology and leveraging our technology with our existing user community and also to reach that next generation of developers and get them excited about what Oracle Database can do for them. We actually have four attendees in our, or four sort of presenters. I also have my little puppy. I don't know if you can see her, she's black, but she's here and she'll be helping me throughout, keeping me super happy. So this is a conversation about unit and regression testing for PL SQL in the real world. And I've got a conversation with three developers who actually do this. And I wanted to say actually do this because of course, Lots of us talk about testing, but we don't necessarily do a lot of it ourselves. And what I want to do with this session is not teach you in great detail about how to use various testing mechanisms. And the focus on this one will be around UTPL SQL. I'll come back to that. But really just to kind of inspire you about what's possible and, and the kind of experiences they've had and the, the benefits they've had of doing this unit testing. So the agenda, we'll do some introductions. We'll explore generally why should you unit test and why should you regression test? What in fact is a regression test? Then we're gonna move on to a very interesting topic using Excel of all things as a test harness based on top of a unit testing framework. And that will be with Stefan. And then we'll move on to UTPL SQL which is one of the dominant unit testing frameworks and the new version three that's being developed. And we have two of the developers on that, on that uh, framework talking about their experiences with unit testing and showing you what you'd be able to do with version three of this powerful unit testing framework. Our unit testing code talkers today, Yasek, Pavel, and Stefan from Russia, from Warsaw, from Stefan. Germany. Germany? Yes. Yeah, Germany. So what I'm going to do is allow them to introduce themselves. They can do it a lot better than I can. And then we'll start exploring the topics in more detail. Yasek, take over. Hi, I'm Jacek Gabel. I'm a senior software engineer for Fidelity Investments currently in Ireland. So moved to Ireland two years ago, um, working with Oracle SQL and PL SQL since 1998. It's quite a time. Oracle 8i was my first database. And in the meantime, I did a certified Scrum Master certification, so I'm kind of well oriented in the Agile world, actually working in an Agile way at the moment. Uh, and I'm also kind of infected with all that's lean, Agile, and test-driven development related, um, trying to make the best of my coding uh, practices and also spread it across the world. I'm one of the authors of UTP SQL version 3 unit testing framework. Uh, together with Power, we, we did tremendous amount of work to get it done and delivered. So it was just released a week ago. And uh, before that, I was contributing to Ruby, Ruby PL SQL and Ruby PL SQL spec unit testing framework for PL SQL, which are based on the Ruby object-oriented programming languages. Thanks, Jacek. Let's move on to Pavel. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm a PL SQL developer for more than five years, I would say even more than six years. Uh, and I've also worked for different projects, OLTP projects, uh, data warehouse projects, uh, which I'm currently employed now. Uh, we produce uh, built-in box, uh, box software. So we are vendor Russia, software vendor in Russia. Um, and I've been using test-driven test development or maybe more just test writing for the PL SQL developer, uh, for PL SQL develop, for PL SQL, let's say, software, PL SQL based software, uh, for two years. Actually, maybe I was the, the first in the world uh, production user of the UT PL SQL version 3 framework, 
uh, which I also took part of for the last year. Thanks, Pavel. <laughs> Finally, Stefan. Yeah, hi, I am Stefan. Um, 20 years about uh, PLSQL, PLSQL uh, developing, and the last 10 years, I think I'm using UTPLSQL now. And the last five years, I think I'm focusing on uh, continuous integration and uh, on regression testing. And I'm trying to evangelize other teams to do also unit testing. This is my focus uh, the last years um, that I do some presentations and uh, doing together with the audience, uh, yeah, uh, test-driven development. And today you will see, we will maybe do it together. Yeah, and in the last years, I do it with Excel because Excel is, for me, the most readable thing how to define unit tests. And yeah, maybe we do it together today. That's all. Thanks, Stefan. And hopefully, you're all as intrigued as I was when I first heard from Stefan about using Excel for unit testing PLSQL code. I've seen a demonstration before. You're about to see one. It was pretty fascinating stuff. Okay, so let's just step back a little bit and uh, talk for a few moments. Don't growl, Pup. I'm going to put you down. <laughs> um, talk about writing software, testing software, and then we're going to get into more of the details of what testing means for us and what it could and should mean. So hopefully you agree with me that writing software is a lot of fun. We are so lucky to be software developers. What a great job. I mean, literally, they pay us to sit around and think about stuff and write it down. And if you, like me, think of your software as a form of poetry, of creative you know, creation, you are being paid to write poetry. Wow, what a cool job. So writing software is a lot of fun. Unfortunately, software often has bugs in it. And buggy software can be very embarrassing, can be very expensive, and even sometimes actually deadly. Now, I'm hoping that none of you have been working on an application that has actually resulted in, in physical harm to humans or other creatures. Mostly, we just end up with a lot of irritated users and a lot of frustration for ourselves. And it sure would be nice to avoid having buggy software. I bet you'd all agree. The problem is, while writing software is a lot of fun, testing software is uh, work. And it can be kind of boring, though, as Stefan pointed out to me, he likes <laughs> testing software. And you know, some developers are kind of strange that way, and we love them for it. But most of us developers, and I include myself very much in that camp, want to focus on the fun stuff, writing it, coming up with cool solutions to, to tough problems. And you know, let somebody else worry about the bugs, like our users. But that's a bad move. So we all know we should test. We should test a lot. And often we do not. So what I'd like to do is explore with these fine developers who are with us who actually have built up the practice and dedication of more comprehensive and rigorous testing to share their experiences, talk about how they became addicted uh, to testing and hopefully share some of that enthusiasm and experience and inspiration with you. So, <clears throat> why should you unit test? So first of all, what is a unit test? What does that mean? It means you're testing individual units of code. You're not sitting in front of the website and running through the user interface testing the application level testing. This is a matter of individual developers testing individual units of code. So, what's the value here? And I'm just going to share this out. I'm going to assign this out as we go through this list, and then people can join in. So clear thinking about requirements, TDD. So it's a number of you had mentioned TDD. Why don't you go ahead and, and tell us further about your TDD-based experience and what that means in terms of thinking about requirements? Who wants to grab the mic first? I can go first. Um, so for me, test-driven development, which is TDD, is actually a, a not really well named practice because it's not about tests and people think okay test driven development is about writing tests just that you do it differently and um, test driven development is actually about for, for myself it's about requirements because when you do test driven development your requirements come first and then you don't rush to <clears throat> into writing your software without thinking about what are the exact requirements. So, test-driven development allows me uh, to 
first think about what it is that I'm supposed to do and turn it into a test and then after that go in and, and implement the, the actual requirement that satisfies the test and that way I'm quite confident that what I did is actually satisfying the requirements and that's the, the basic thing about the software I think. We, we need to think that our software needs to meet all the requirements of our users and if you don't follow this practice it's really hard to achieve. I think this test-driven development is the practice that's actually embracing satisfying user requirements and making sure that all of them are always met. So for those of you who aren't familiar with test-driven development, the idea is that you literally don't write code until you've written your tests. You write your tests first and your tests encapsulate your requirements. And then as you build your code, you, you can start running it against your tests as you build it. The, the, the approach we generally use is we say, oh, my manager said write a program that does X, whatever that means, do X. And we think we know what, what it means and we dive in and we start writing a lot, a lot, a lot of code. 500, 1,000 lines later, we start testing, and then of course it's very difficult to sort through what you've implemented, what you haven't implemented, and make sense of what you've done. So TDD allows you to do things in a very incremental fashion. Very few of us do it. So I would suggest that in terms of TDD, go ahead and explore it. But one approach you might want to take is simply ask yourself this before you start writing your next program. How will I know when I'm done? It's a very simple question, right? You're writing a program and at some point you stop working on that program. How will you know when you're done? And if you Literally just ask yourself that question and write down a list of these are the things I know my program has to do before I can say it's done. That's sort of the TDD on the cheap and will still, I think, help move you forward pretty dramatically. So finding bugs early. Anybody have any stories about how unit testing has helped them in this area, finding bugs early and more cheaply than, than in production? Uh, let me jump in. Uh, it's a little bit not about finding bugs early, but uh, maybe a little more about requirements, and this is how you find your bugs early, like a, like a reason why you do so. Uh, when you, even if by any reason you don't practice TDD, which is not really good, you should try one if you do, if you haven't yet. Uh, but at some point, maybe even if you're PL, mostly if you're PL SQL developer, uh, you might already have an application that you work on and you might already have some stuff that is already implemented and you just make some changes to it. Uh, maybe you create a new model and, or something like this and if you are going to write your first test there, uh, you have to, you find yourself in absolutely unusual situation for you. You not only think of an algorithm you have to implement, but you should, you have to also know the answer, the exact answer. What should come from your function, from your module, from your algorithm? What would be the answer? So you're not, uh, you know, implementing the, the algorithm and just execute it and walk through it with the debugger and see, oh yeah, here it does, it does something nice. Maybe here it's not very clean. Maybe I should change something. You're not just reverse engineering the answer, but you have to know it a priori. Uh, and this is how you can find your bugs early. So if you have all the answers listed, uh, while you're developing, you can find uh, the break in the logic, something that cannot be done, something that uh, either, be ha either has to be this or that. It can't be both simultaneously. So you can find the problems with the, the, with the requirements you have right writing your tests or in the early stages of the development. Great. Yeah, I can jump in to, to just comment on what Pavel just mentioned because he was talking about debugging and I must say that since I started unit testing I literally don't use debug mode in my PLSQL code at all. I, and I don't really need to and I don't find a reason to do that because if I have all of my tests and uh, that they actually serve me as a way to find what the code is doing and how it is working. And uh, the same goes for the DBMS output that you put kind of as a debug mode in your in your code. I don't use that either. I, actually, I don't need to. So that's that's what you get with your test. Like I think people try to mimic all of those things that they could do with proper testing by using debugger or by using DBMS output somewhere in their code to find out oh, what the hell is going on here. That's an interesting point. Certainly, a, a great selling point for testing would be you don't have to spend so much time debugging. Wow, because debugging is painful. 
Stefan, would you want to address the make changes with confidence based on your yeah. experience? Make changes with confidence. Uh, I often had the situation that there's some complex logic in a data warehouse yeah, and nobody, t nobody dared to change the code yeah, because it was uh, very core functionality and everybody and nobody knows oh, what's happening here if I change it, if I refactor it, okay it's very slow but I, I, don't, uh, I don't dare to change it. Yeah? Yeah. And if you have many tests here, many unit tests here, so, oh, so I have the experience in the last years we are refactoring everything in our data warehouse and we are refactoring it very very fast and everybody, everybody does it because he knows it will work after the change as well because it's all covered with so many unit test cases. We are running 70,000 unit tests in uh, every hour. So we How many thousand? 70,000 in the moment. Seven zero. 70,000. <laughs> yeah. And wow. so we, we know what's going on. And if we do a change and we're changing, yeah. So because we know uh, we can change, we do changes. Yeah. We are refactoring everything. Yeah. It's no problem. So this is one of the most important things uh, why we should do unit testing, why we should do regression testing. Yeah? So if somebody does a change even on a table statement or a create table statement or on a few or in the code, all those tests are uh, executed and you will see half an hour later there is something wrong yeah? and you have to change it again. That's all right, let's move on to the, sorry, didn't mean to interrupt. Just want to make sure we don't spend too much time in the preface and back get to the others. Let's talk about this second to last one, forces you to write testable code. This was something that really struck me. Um, I would say that most of the code we PL SQL developers write, maybe, that everybody writes is virtually untestable. Database program testing is harder than non-database programming testing, first of all, because you have to deal with the interactions with database, and I'm sure we'll be looking at that uh, from the demonstrations that are coming up. But the bottom line is that we end up writing these big modules that might be 500, 1,000 lines long, and they do too many, so many different things. You might have five out parameters, you might change 15 tables, that coming up with a, a set of test cases is really challenging. And if you dedicate yourself to unit testing, then one of the things you get is you write smaller, more modular code that are easier to test individually. And then you can combine them and test them with more confidence as well. Anybody have any particular experience about that actually rewriting a piece of code? to make it more testable and therefore more reliable? Well, I can just share my um, experiences well, like 10 years ago or so, or even less. I actually left a company that I was working for for about 10 years. And uh, two months after, I got a call from one of my colleagues saying, Jacek, what the hell have you done? I mean, <laughs> this, this SQL statement that you have written is like, 2,000 lines long and it's doing, you know, multiple uh, uh, analytical functions and doing custom uh, aggregation functions, etc., etc. How am I supposed to change it now? And I said, well, I did it for performance and because, you know, we can do so much with single SQL statement. So I mm -hmm. just did it, you know, adding more and more stuff on top of that. And just a few years later, I came out of that habit of putting too much things into SQL as a single statement, even though you can do it. Because how can you know if the, all of that SQL as a single statement uh, is um, easy to, oh, sorry, it's not easy to change it. And how do you know if everything is working, especially if you have zero unit tests. And at that time, I wasn't practicing test driven development. I wasn't practicing unit testing. We had zero tests on our code and everything was tested manually, which took a lot, a lot of time. So. I, I was actually very sad and, and uh, ashamed to say to my colleague, well, sorry, I'm not, I'm not working there anymore. And you kind of need to deal with that and maybe rewrite <laughs> it, I don't know, split it. But yeah, that's what you can end up with. Right? You can end up with a huge elements of code that are really hard to test or really hard to change. Okay, so the bottom line is that if you start to use, take a unit testing approach and build unit tests rigorously, You'll find bugs earlier, you'll have fewer bugs in production, you'll be able to t build your code and change it with more confidence. And the bottom line is that you'll actually feel a lot better about your code. You can almost see testing as a sort of game. Uh, how well can, can I do this round? All right, let's move on because I don't want to use up all our time before we get to the demonstrations. And then just to finish up, so we talked about unit testing, individual units. Let's talk about regression testing for a moment. 
it's a pretty common term. You've probably all heard it. You may not ever have really thought about what it means. So it's called regression testing because you want to test to make sure your application doesn't regress or go backwards. And it's this very classic situation of version one works. It has bugs, but you know basically the users are pretty comfortable with it and know how to do their work in it. Then you upgrade to version two and like, wow, so many new great features. And yet it broke features in version one that people use on a day-by-day -day basis. It's got to be one of the least pleasant experiences for both developers and their users and something to really avoid. So let's just see if there's anything to add around regression testing over what we just talked about with unit testing. Uh, any thoughts before we move on? No, it's, uh, I think I already said it before with regression testing. It's because you have more confidence in your, what you're doing. Yeah, If you have many tests and you don't do them regression testing, yeah. so if uh, any change on the code uh, and it is not regression tested, then it's only half worth. And, and as I think that, Dustin came up with this FDD, fear-driven development. And this is something that Stefan was mentioning, like you, you you, if you don't have unit tests, you actually say, oh, don't change that, don't, don't touch that, right? Well, we should improve performance on this perform particular query, or you know, maybe rewrite it. But actually nobody dares because it's so sensitive. It is critical for the, for the company. Like, this is the core of our system. We can't change it, we can't touch it, and we have no tests. So if, we, if you t touch it, you will break it, and you will be f f kind of guilty of it. And so many engineers, and I hear it over and over again, are saying, well, I will just touch what I have to and nothing more. And if, even if I see that I can maybe change a little bit in, in the other procedure, because it is you know, not written in, an, in the best way, they don't do it because they are afraid that if, if they change it, they, they need to go into full manual regression. Mm -hmm. And that's you know the fear factor and the cost factor that you don't want to carry on. Yeah, and the last right. point is maybe very, uh, very important too. Yeah, it makes you sleep more easy. Yeah, <laughs> because uh, it's it's healthy. Yeah, it's healthy. If you have everything tested, it really makes you sleep well. <laughs> yeah. And All uh, right. maybe. Go ahead. Yeah, maybe short story. Uh, recently, I had a discussion with my colleague uh, about not why should I test. He asked another question. He asked, for whom should I write test? If I don't need them, or maybe I should, but you know, I don't want to spend that much time on it. For whom this test I have to read, uh, to write, uh, for whom I have to code them. Uh, and I said that you write tests not for yourself, but for the whole other team, for all of us, for the, all the team members, for all the programmers, uh, for them to benefit from your test. Because if you have written this test, if you have coded it, then they might have, might introduced the bug and they will know they have done they have introduced the bug uh, somewhere in the future but how they can know it the only way uh, they can is if you run your test and to run them you have to run them as frequently as possible maybe on uh, every single commit to your uh, version control system maybe on each release uh, maybe on each release branch as frequently as possible. So it is very, very important not only to write tests, but also to establish the whole infrastructure of running them according to your code. So you have to build your, uh, it's very common buzzy words like CI, CD, like a deployment pipeline where you code, then you deploy your code to your test environment where all the tests are executed and afterwards only it is deployed. And if only all the tests are green, all the tests have successfully uh, successfully executed. It is the only way how the uh, good enough software can be produced. If you have broken tests, then you have some work to do. You can't deploy it or release it right now. So you have to establish your pipeline, deployment pipeline, and execute your, trust, your tests as frequently as possible. Just, just one point. So we. Uh, for whom do I write tests? Uh, in the first case, I write it for myself, for the developer. But then I will, we, we have in our company, we have unit test reviews. So we don't have only uh, our, define our tests, but other people are looking at the unit tests mm -hmm. and we are discussing about them and we are adapting and, and, and uh, um, um, yeah, and we are adapting them and adding them you know, together 
minimum three people are unit testing reviews in the, in the, in the meetings. Yeah, that's Impressive. very important. Yeah. All right. Well, listen. There's been a lot of talk and a lot of buzzwords thrown around. TDD, FDD, CI/CD. We're going to explore a lot of these things. Let's move along. So there are lots of tools out there for unit testing PL SQL code. Um, there was a time, but it's been a long time now, where D PL SQL developers could say, you know, it's not like Java and JUnit and those other uh, communities where there are a lot of tools available. We don't have these tools. You've got tools available to you, many of them. And just to give you a sense of the, the variety, there is UTPL SQL, which I originally wrote in 1999, and is, is probably one of my more successful pieces of software. I'm not currently on the project anymore. Yes, many thanks. Follow. Many thanks to Stephen. <laughs> yeah. Most, many thanks it. for using my software because, as you know, if you write a program and nobody ever uses it, did you really <laughs> write that program? So UTPL SQL, which is undergoing kind of a, 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 a new generation of life with version 3 that you'll see more about. SQL Developer has integrated unit testing. So within, so as you'll hear with UTPL SQL, you write the test code and then the framework runs the tests and reports on them for you. SQL Developer and Co-Tester for Oracle, which is from Quest, and is the only commercial tool I know about that does these sorts of things, they both do some level of automated generation of test codes, so you can certainly check those out. And then there are a whole variety of other open source frameworks, PLUnit, DBUnit, DBFit, etc. Today, we're going to focus on UTPL SQL, partly because these are the folks who I've been hearing about most lately, unit testing really comprehensively, aggressively, whatever. And also, when I learned that the version 3 implementation was about to be released, I thought it'd be a great time to make sure that more and more people hear about V3 and what it can do for you. So now let's move over to, let's stop the talking, let's start the demonstrating. I'd like to have Stefan talk to us about, no, talk to us about using UTPL SQL with the Excel framework. So let's change the we presenter. Have two, two slides, no, no, we have two slides, Stephen. Oh, I'm sorry, yes. Yeah, we have two slides in your presentation as well. I was just looking for you. Now everybody is listed as somebody I can choose from. So let's find me again. Where am I? Uh -oh. I just wanted to show that uh, in a data warehouse, what is a unit? A unit is a very complex thing in, in a data warehouse because we are doing ETLs, extract, transform, load, and the most complexity is in the, in the T, in the transformation. So we have many source tables. We have a PLSQL code or uh, some, some grouping stuff. And or it could be as well any ETL tool like Informatica, Talent, whatever. And then we have one target table. Could you switch to the next slide, please? Can you hear me? You don't see my, the next slide? No, I only see Stefan and using UTP and SQL with Excel, not the next slide. Defining tests with Excel and UTPL SQL, you don't see that now? No. 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 That's very curious because I'm showing it on my slide. Hmm. Let's see. Now do you see okay. it? Yeah, that's, that's also fine. Uh, there would be one before, but this is also fine. Okay, so why did I come to, to Excel as a testing tool uh, in this case? Okay, it's, it's fine uh, because I told about there are many source tables. We have an ETL tool or PL SQL, and we have usually one or more target tables. That's that's the common uh, testing thing we have in the data warehouse. Yeah? The most complexity is in, in this. Yeah? So, why do I use Excel? Yeah? UTP or SQL is a very cool framework, but it's still much to code if you have to do all those insert statements, all those select statements to the target table. Um, so, <clears throat> yeah, but it must be very easy to define unit tests to bring a developer in testing mode. It's very, that's a very difficult thing to bring a developer to test. So it must be really easy. Yeah? And I already told in data warehousing a unit is a very complex thing. So another point, um, not only the de developer should look at the tests, also some uh, business people or somebody who knows the business or knows what the de developer should do yeah, in this transformation. So um, it must be in a very readable form that you can uh, talk about and discuss about uh, with other people, which uh, are 
no coders. Yeah. So that's also a point for Excel because the business people they know what do they know? They know Excel. Yeah. So I always define data also using Excel often. Yeah. To, to generate some insert statements. Yeah? Um, if I have to do some 100 insert statements, I do copy paste and change it in Excel, use some functions, whatever. So why don't use Excel for unit testing? So, and this I want to show you now. So now you can give me the presenter role, Steven. Working Steven? on it, just have to find you in the long list. Stefan, there we go. Yeah, thanks a lot. So let me show you now in a live demonstration how we are doing our unit tests and how test-driven development uh, we are living. You know? um, I have an SQL developer and let's do following exercise. We have three tables. We have uh, two source tables. It's really simple. Yeah? Departments and employees and we want to uh, make an ETL which is filling the department's 9080 table. And in this table, we want to have all those departments uh, with the number of employees which are born after 1980. Yeah. This is our exercise. I prepared a package where we firstly make and delete on the target table. And then we're doing an insert statement. So usually in test-driven development, we wouldn't code here. Yeah. We would start with an empty code. but for this presentation, it's fine to, to start with a an, uh, with an skeleton. And I prepared this join. We have departments, join to employees. We are joining them and grouping and making account star. But now let's define our tests. And we are using Excel here. We have three tabs here. You have the source uh, sheet the target and the config. And the config, I say where to connect to. Yeah, this is my database, this is my password, this is my instance. And this is our call we want to test. This is our package and this is our procedure. Then we have our source. There I can do import table. I can uh, like departments. So it uh, imports the structure of our table. And I can define here some test data. Test department ID1, let's say it is called development. And we have another table, it's called uh, employees table. Yeah. Empl table name employees, employee ID um, employee one. Let's also start with an employee name. Let's say it's Feuerstein. Let's say, let's start with um, 1981 now. And now we define our target table. So what do we want to achieve? Yeah. The name of the target table was Department 1980. Here I can define how many records do we really expect in the department table here overall. So in a moment I would say we are expecting only one record because it's department ID with one, department development, um, development, and number of employees we are expecting in the moment one. Because we have one employee here, it's Feuerstein, uh, born after 1980. Yeah? And all we have to do here now is we have defined our test cases, we are running the button test. And it is very fast here, but it really does something. We will see it later. Yeah? So everything is green. Our code, which we coded, is doing fine. And we can go on and define our next test case. So um, what would we now do? Maybe employee two. It's me, I'm very old. Let's say 1960. I'm also in the department one. And 
now, what do we expect? We would still expect uh, that the number of employees is still one because we say they must be born after 1980. Yeah? We run the button test and we see, oh, no, it doesn't work. We are expecting only one, but we got two. So we look at the code. We are seeing, oh, we, we missed some filter here. And let's do it. Uh, the birthday must be bigger than to date. So it's German, right? Uh, German format here. Don't be confused. Let's do it like this, maybe. Okay, let's try it out. We are doing test driven. It's uh, no problem to execute it again and again. We are just checking if it, oh, the code is okay. It seems to, yeah. But let's do the next test case. Um, what are we missing here? We have one before, one after. We have, let's make another one. Let's do um, human resources, maybe. While Stefan is doing that, I don't know if you, you caught the little sense of excitement, but I do every time I see that, seeing that red turn to green. And you didn't, you know, you just set up the test, you go in and make your change, and you get immediate verification that it's now working where it wasn't before. Whether it's with <laughs> this framework or any other framework built on UTPL SQL. Okay. Um, yeah, but, okay, let's say human resources now, and what do we, what would we expect? Yeah, we would say there should be a human resources now. Human resources. Oops, a typo. Human uh, should make a simpler one. Number of employees should be zero. Let's check if everything is okay. So we see, oh, we uh, we missed something. Yeah, our test case it's it's red here. Do you see the red? Yeah, I hope so. So we are expecting human resources here, but we we don't have anything like this. Yeah. So let's check our code again. So what did we wrong here? Yeah. It looks like a problem with the left join here. And yeah, maybe that's all. We don't know. Yeah, let's check. Let's check. I don't know. I'm stupid. Oh, it's still red. Okay, there's something else missing here. Okay, this must be maybe here in the in the outer join as well. I don't know. Yeah. You sure it's not because you spelled human resources with two S's? It's it's still red. Yeah, so something is wrong here. Okay, let's let's check again. What's what's going on? Okay, maybe account star. Okay, left join. Yeah, let's. Okay, it's a left join, and we also want to have those departments which doesn't have any customers. So it's not account star. It's something like account employee ID. Yeah. So this is. Also, it is a very simple example. You can do very, very much mistakes here. Yeah? And with this method that you define your tests here, and this is really fast, you, you, you see it. Yeah? And now we are doing our test. Okay, it's again something wrong, but okay, let's have a look. Number of employees, it's zero now. Now this is green. The other thing was uh, before it was red, now it's green. But oh, okay, we have here, uh, okay, this is not in English, yeah? but this is, the <laughs> over, this is the overall count in the table. Yeah? We are still thinking we have only have one record in the table. Yeah, but that's wrong now. We are expecting two records in the table because we have two, two departments. Yeah? So that's the last thing. Okay, and now we see everything is green. Yeah? And now we are fine, or we, we would think about uh, other test cases, um, but you see how fast this is, and you see, and now you will see what can we do with it, yeah? Because what's happening behind the scene is generating UTPL SQL, you're generating the test package from the H from the Excel. From the Excel, we are generating the test package. Nice. So, and you see, we have here our delete our source tables. We are deleting the source tables. We are inserting something in the, in the source tables. We are executing something, 
uh, we are committing, and then we do the selects and we do the you know the UT asset things um, against the database, and everything is shown in the in the HTML side. So this is I think the really the, the fastest way how to define tests and how to see if everything is working. And now you can do this package into regression testing, like. Um, do I have it somewhere? Okay. Stefan, we have just a couple more minutes for you and then we need to move over. We took too much time to talk at the beginning. Okay. So, yeah, that's the way how we are doing unit tests here in, in our company and we are putting this uh, package into regression testing and uh, with Jenkins. And now the other peoples will show us, uh, I guess, Team City or whatever with, uh, with regression testing things. Yeah. Thank you, Stefan. And actually, just one thing go back to your generated test package because we haven't actually looked at any of the actual test code, just, just so you know, so the utassert.eq, if you could highlight one of those. This is an example of using the high-level API that's built into UTPL SQL. So you're not writing things like, if x equals y, then raise an error or report that it worked. You just call utassert.eq, and it checks for equality, writes the information out to the table, and then that information is then used later for the reporting. So that's where the, the, the framework is taking the testing work off of you, and doing it for you while you're doing the database setup, which is really fantastically generated for you out of the Excel spreadsheet. Very cool. Yes, also right. I like the, the, the reporter functionality that you are, you provided. Everybody can do his own reporter. So I uh, coded this HTML reporter, and it's easy to uh, import it into your uh, unit testing, into UTP SQL. This I like very much. All right, thank you, Stefan. All right, so what we're going to do now is switch over. So I'm going to take back presenter. Think, yes. PowerPoint. Okay, Yasek. So let's now switch over to taking a look at UTPL SQL and particularly what you've been doing with version three. Uh, there's obviously, as you can see from the slide, everybody, there are a lot of new features. We're not going to have time to go. We don't want to go into all the details. We want to give you a sense of what's possible with this framework and, and how Yasek and Pavel have been using it as well. Yeah, so we found that the UTP SQL version 2, which you, Stephen, were working, was working on, and not only because after, we, after you, the few, few other people were uh, contributing to the project, is not being maintained anymore, and we figured it, it, it's a bit outstanding co compared to the, you know, JUnit for Java or, or other modern uh, unit testing frameworks that are you know, continuously developed and continuously improved across the years as people use them more and more. So we thought, okay, let's try to catch up and try to do something uh, that would match the, the, the frameworks that are available for other programming languages. So one of the features you have is, you know, you can compare data in multiple ways. You, you don't compare it only for equality, you can compare it for inequality, you know, being empty, being null, being greater than, you know, kind of like what you get in PL SQL itself. But that you can most of the operators you can use in in, in PL SQL for comparison of variables you can do in in PL, in UTPL SQL as well as a as a test, and then uh, we also support native comparison of complex data data types, which is kind of going beyond what what PL SQL allows you to do, because you can't natively compare a UDT or you know a, a object type in Oracle to another object type unless you do some extra coding around it and we can compare it for you. So there is lots of those very cool features around uh, uh, UTP SQL version 3 which I could talk about for an hour I guess um, but all, it's all, all well documented on the UTP SQL project site and uh, you can have a look at them and Pavel will surely show some of those features now so I'll just uh, move over to, to Pavel. Okay. Pavel, should I give you the presenter? Yep. Okay. And while you're doing so, first of all, I'm really proud to be the to to make this first presentation of the framework publicly. So, let's see. Uh, I will not go through this TDD approach of development uh, to make it a little bit shorter. Imagine that we have. Uh, several procedures or some stuff that is already implemented in our database and we would like uh, to write some tests uh, for this new functionality. And the first thing that we have to do 
is we have to define our first test package. And to define our first test package, test package, all we have to do is this. That's it. Actually, we have already defined our first test package. So we use this approach of annotations. This kind of lock, uh, like uh, comments, uh, are used to show that this one, this thing is uh, connected to the UTP SQL framework. Uh, but the empty unit, uh, the empty test package is not very interesting. I think we should define our first test procedure. Uh, and uh, let me help myself uh, and just copy and paste it. So in our test package, we have defined that it is a test package and we have defined our first test procedure by using this annotation. So we have annotated this test procedure and we also uh, provided the description that will be shown that is more readable and more understandable to human beings. Uh, now let's define a very simple implementation for our uh, test procedure. Here is it. So you see, uh, this, this is the way how you define your uh, assertion, your expectations using the framework. So we uh, expect that the outcome from our between string function that actually makes the substring from second to the fifth element of the string uh, will equal to this one, which is true. Just a uh, quick no. comment there. Stay, stay on the body for a moment, Pavel. So yeah. for any of you who have used UTPL SQL in the past, one of the big changes moving to v3 is that they've moved from the package-based implementation to an object type implementation. So you're seeing here object-oriented syntax. You might want to explain a little bit of that before you move on. Um, yeah, actually we use uh, object-based uh, object, uh, implementation of the framework itself. Uh, but uh, for the most of the um, users, there won't be much of of this uh, object level knowledge, so you don't have to know how to implement uh, object oriented uh, uh, software using uh, PLSQL, or, or maybe you don't have to. You don't need to have a deep understanding of how, of how it works. So it's quite simple, like chaining the functions here and nothing more. So there is no constructors, etc. So let, I think that we have to run our first test defined. And to do so, all you have to do is run this. Very simple. The UT uh, package is the entrance point uh, for the user of the framework. And UT run is the simplest uh, procedure how you can execute it. So let's run and see the results. Cool. You see we have a test suite that is defined in our test package. And we have our test that is uh, described with a description. And we have a summary of all the tests that have been executed. So we have one test and it is green. So there is no failure or something. Now let's define several additional uh, tests. Let me also copy and paste it. So this is most likely how you uh, evaluate your test suites. So you define uh, more and more uh, test cases and implement them. And as he's doing that, just the, the annotations feature is something that they were showing me a few weeks ago, and it's pretty neat. So basically, it allows you to document the test case inside the package specification itself, and that is pulled out automatically and used in the, in the generation of the test results. Yes, exactly. So you don't need any additional configuration. So you just compile your additional test packages, and they are plugged into the framework. Yeah, very easy. So we have we have defined additional tests. Now let's execute it. Oh, look what we have. We have several tests. Some of them have failed, and we have detailed explanation of why uh, why it has failed. So we have. Uh, a line number where the failure occurred, uh, what uh, assertion failed, and we have a summary uh, of uh, how many f there were failed tests, how many errors there were. Uh, failed means the exception, ha unaccept unhandled exception arise from there. And we have uh, one test disabled. Uh, by some reason, we have disabled this test. Uh, so now let's um, compile additional packages so we have uh, a more complex situation to look around. Oh. And now let's execute it. 
we have just compiled additional packages, no more configuration, and what we have here, we have uh, additional suites here with additional tests, so you can in evaluate your uh, test uh, environment pretty easy and pretty quickly. You just compile so new tests. Sorry, so ut.run automatically detects all the packages you've set up to be test suites and yeah, runs them for you. Yeah, exactly. And all, all you have to do is say dash dash percent suite and it, it is automatically picked up. Yeah, all you have to do is define this kind of annotation. If you have a package with this annotation, then it is a UTPL SQL version 3 test suite, uh, test package, so it's a suite. Uh, and uh, this is how you define your test procedures. And if we look around uh, for these test packages. Let's open it. Oh. Yeah, here you can see additional annotations. Uh, so this procedure will be execute. Uh, so for so before this test, uh, this test procedure, this one will be executed, and it has some preparation that has to be made before the test can be executed. Let's say we have uh, to create some document, then to execute a function for this document and then uh, check that uh, it went as expected. And let's take a look here. And these annotations uh, are a style, are annotations used in JUnit as well? Yeah, and uh, to be it more convenient for other people, we try to stick to the same annotation, uh, to use the same annotations as in JUnit version 5. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's more convenient uh, for other developers to be used. Uh, we have... Uh, yeah, that's it. And so actually, when you think about it, uh, sorry, Pavel, when you yeah. think about it, we kind of try to mimic what's best on the market, f looking at JUnit and RSpec. So the the UTXPact syntax is actually mimicking what RSpec is allowing to do with Ruby. And we thought that it's actually a bit more convenient than uh, the assert syntax, which is in JUnit, hmm. because it, when you look at this, the way it is built, it's kind of human readable. I say you can read it as I expect this mm -hmm. value to equal that value, and you say I expect this value to be null, for example. Mm -hmm. So you can we have those matchers, and you can use them in very very different ways. And when it comes to those all all of those annotations, uh, Pavel did a really great job, we defining all of those different. Uh, Possible possibilities and making things that I thought were impossible actually working product because I said, well, okay, annotations, great. How can you do that? <laughs> Thank you. So uh, this simple uh, entrance point allow not only to execute you all the tests but. Uh, also to configure your execution. Maybe you're interested in uh, executing tests from another schema, and uh, then you just define the schema. Uh, maybe you're more interested in execution, not all of the tests, but uh, some specific uh, test package. Maybe if you have changed a single function, first of all you have to, uh, you would like to execute uh, tests that test this changed function. Uh, to to have uh, the response as quick as possible, so you can execute a single test package. Here is it, uh, or you can even uh, execute a single uh, test procedure. And here it is, uh, and all the configuration that has to be made before this test can be executed, like the preparation function to be called, as we have seen previously. Uh, the framework will handle it, so it will make all the all the necessary preparation, execute the test, and uh, clean up after it. Okay, uh, now I, I hate to say it, but we are at 11:55, yeah. and we wanted to also talk about some CI/CD. Is it yes? Would it be okay to switch over? Yeah, and to demonstrate how, as as I said previously, it is very important to uh, implement not only the test but also the the CI/CD approach, the deployment pipeline, so your test can be executed uh, as frequently and uh, as frequently as uh, possible. And what to is show how CI/CD, this... Pavel? What what are those what do those initials mean? Oh, the CI/CD is a buzzy word, another buzzy word. It means the some kind of service, some kind of uh, environment, or a server, or uh, maybe scheduler uh, that executes a predefined scenarios like uh, 
run all the tests or uh, install my patch that I have just uh, created and run all the tests and gather all the, all the results, etc. Uh, so and CI, wait, so really, you're talking to PL SQL developers. We're very, very basic people here. So CI is continuous integration yeah. and CD is continuous delivery. Yeah. Okay, go ahead. So let's run our tests. And you're uh, now, now using Team City, is it? Yes, uh, I'm currently using Team City because it is the tool that I uh, use for work uh, for the last four years. We've been using it for our uh, continuous integration uh, pipeline, uh, so I'm, it's pretty convenient for me to use. And here is it: uh, the UTPL SQL framework produces the test execution results both for a popular uh, continuous integration engines like Jenkins or Team City or Hudson in a native way. So Team City recognized that there were some tests executed. Here, all the tests are listed. And, so, uh, so UTPL SQL v3 has the hooks to make it easy to use Team City with your UTPL SQL tests. Yes, and also with Jenkins and also with any other environment that uh, consumes uh, X unit uh, test reporting. In a native way, most of the common continuous integrations framework do so. So uh, just plug the framework and uh, and be happy with all these cool results that are have that have been never possible for PL SQL development, only right. for Java or Node or something like this. So here we have a detailed explanation. Uh, what has occurred, what caused the problem, and also UTPL SQL three comes with the coverage. Uh, coverage means uh, coverage percent is the percent of how much code was executed while your tests were executed. So how much uh, of your code was touched by your test at least once. Uh, and we produce uh, several different uh, coverage reports. For example, HTML report. And here you can see that uh, from three functions that we have used, only uh, all of them were covered. Uh, one for eighty percent, and if we come in, we can see uh, how much uh, each line was covered. And you can see here that this is red because it was not covered. So uh, no of the test has uh, has touched this line. So this is big. I, I for a number of years ago in Quest Code Tester for Oracle, we worked on code coverage based on the profiler information. It's really hard to do. These guys did an amazing job, and even and there'll be I've, we've talked about it already in twelve C twelve point two. Oracle is adding a code coverage package, which we're still working on sort of finishing up in a patch release. Um, and then there'll be, you'll be able to use it through this as well. But this is really great stuff that has not really been available before. Now we're almost out of time. Just so you guys know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna post a slide in a moment that has links to all these different resources. You'll also be getting a link to the slides and obviously the recording. So you'll be able to go and check out the UTPL SQL project and all these different tools uh, with, with that information. Yep. Just one more thing that I, one more thing that I would like to mention, maybe uh, that we also integrate with Sonar. So I don't know if you are familiar or with. Uh, or for those of you who who knows uh, who know that what Sonar is, it's and those those that don't, Sonar is a static code analysis framework for different languages, and uh, <clears throat> so it is analyzing your code and finding if if you have, I don't know bad practices on your code or maybe use bad formatting and besides that it also can show a code coverage and it can also show test results but it kind of requires a very sonar specific format so we also provide that so if you want to use sonar as your source of information about code quality along with code coverage and unit tests you can you can do that using PLC, UTP SQL version 3 so I like to honor all the attendees who have, who have committed an hour to this webinar do not go way overboard, way over the time. So here's a slide that provides lots of links out to the work these guys have been doing. Um, certainly the easiest thing to do is just go to GitHub and look for UTPL SQL. You'll find lots of links to the project source, to the downloads, to demonstration projects, and so on. So it should be a great starting point for all of you. Uh, Stefan, any thoughts about how if somebody looked at your demonstration they said, wow, I love that. I want to start using Excel with UTPL SQL. Any thoughts about next steps they can take? Reach out to you directly or otherwise? Stefan, are you still there? Uh-oh. 
Okay, sorry. <laughs> I, okay, I was muted. I was muted. Sorry. Um, okay, if someone uh, wants to have more information on this, I've created a Twitter account um, last week, and it's called uh, UTP SQL XL, like Excel, uh, not extra large. It's like <laughs> like Excel, but it's uh, it's written like uh, extra large. Uh, UTP SQL XL. Right. So if you would like to get more information from Stefan about Excel and and UTP SQL. Utilize that Twitter account, reach out to him, and uh, and he'll follow up. And hopefully, at some point, we'll see some blog posts and so forth about so how everybody. This Twitter account is uh, pretty new, as a brand new. Um, no followers, so please follow me now. <laughs> oh, yes, follow him. <laughs> All right. So zooming through my slides. Okay, we are out of time. Um, let's see if we've got any questions so far. I've got one. Thank you, but no other questions. Anybody have any questions about? General unit testing, regression testing, using UTPL SQL, or you could share your experience as well. So the comment I've got here is, even though everything went really fast for a developer like me who knows nothing about testing, that was a lot of very useful information. Yeah, so the idea for today was not really to have you come out of this saying, now I know how to use UTPL SQL, but hopefully to be inspired by what these tools can do for you, how they've helped others, and hopefully you can dive in and, and give it a try. Let's see how to set up. How do you set up coverage quickly? Is there a link to this? So in terms of doing the code coverage, that caught Robert's attention. Yeah, so I think uh, you can have a look at our pro demo project and you can have a look how, how, how we integrate with Sonar. And there is also a documentation uh, talking about how you use code coverage reporting from UTP or SQL. So, and of course, if you have any questions, just ask on Twitter or join the uh, Slack uh, team community. I'm not sure if Slack is listed here, but if you want, you can find it on the project page. And how do we write test cases for complex business logic? Always a great question. <laughs> I would say slowly. <laughs> but, on, but honestly, uh, yeah, the biggest challenge in, in any software engineering is making things that are complex simple. And mm -hmm. the easiest way for me, anyway, is to try to divide it into smaller pieces. And as long as that's possible, then you can you know, always try to test the smaller piece and then build, like make those building blocks and then connect them together. And that's mm -hmm. how you can, first of all, make uh, things reusable and second of all, make them testable. So it's much easier to test small pieces of software than making a, a test for this big 2009 SQL that I have created for some years back. One yeah, other suggestion I have is to, don't worry about how will I ever achieve 100% test coverage and code coverage. Oh my gosh, this is so overwhelming. Do things one step at a time. So start with a relatively simple program or break out one part of your complex business logic into a single unit and build a test for that and start to get used to both the framework and how it works, but also the positive feedback loop of, wow, that was good. I got my red to turn to green. And once you start to get into that mode, you'll want to go back and write more tests. But if you try to tackle the biggest, most complex thing first, it'll just be too frustrating, take too much time and you'll end up abandoning it. That, that would be my guess. We have a, let's see, yes. Has the team considered using Ruby and RSpec for PLSQL unit testing? Jacek, I'm sure you want to answer that. <laughs> yeah, so actually I, I, I have a background of using it. That's why I was contributing to the project before I started writing UTP SQL version three. But the problem with Ruby is that it's not PLSQL. And that's the same with choosing JUnit to test UTPLs, uh, PL SQL code, because I know some teams do that. Some teams use JUnit and they kind of, you know, make those bridges between Java and um, Oracle to, to test uh, PL SQL code using Java code. And you can do the same with Ruby PL SQL. I think it's a bit better uh, than Java, but still doesn't allow uh, everything that doesn't allow you to use the full power of PLSQL language and you also need to learn two languages. Right. Ruby is great, I, I love it, I, I, I used it for two years for unit testing and it was a really nice experience but for people that don't have you know flexibility of you know using many programming languages that might be a bit of a big step. Yeah, here's another question, is the new version of UTPL SQL compatible with tests written in previous versions? Let me answer this. Uh, currently, no, but now we're working on a migration uh, routine, uh, how you can automatically migrate or 
migrate maybe not all of them, but as much as possible, uh, migrate all your old test packages to the version three variant. So we will create all the necessary annotations. We will move all the all the configurations, and we will see how it will go. But we are working on it right now. Yeah. So if I install version three, it 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 exists side by side with version two. In other words, all my current tests still run against the version two packages, or it will disrupt my version two packages. Uh, actually, I don't want to make any promises here, uh, but. If it is technically possible, we would try to implement it this way that uh, you just install the version 3 over your version 2 installation and uh, make no changes and all the same code can be, uh, all your test packages can be executed using version 3 and version 3, version 2. No, but that, that's, yeah, so that's, that's what you're aiming for. I'm saying today, if John is using version 2 of UTPL SQL, should he, he, he can still download and install UTPL SQL version 3 in a separate schema, and the existing code and tests could still run against the existing version 2 platform, is that right? Uh, yeah. yeah. Otherwise, yes, nobody... That, that, that's actually what I was testing, so you can have absolutely do, have okay. both versions in two different schemas and run both old UTPL SQL and new UTPL SQL code Great. at the moment, oh. and maybe we'll have migrations soon. <clears throat> Again, uh, one, one question um, for UTPL SQL 2, there is, for Jenkins, there's a plugin, yeah, so we can use it in, uh, in Jenkins. Is something for UTPL SQL 3 in work? Do you know something? Will we have a, a plugin for Jenkins for UTPL SQL 3? Actually, uh -huh. it is not needed anymore. Not so, actually, yeah, you don't need plugin. However, uh, yeah, so we have our runner, so you can kind of run from command line, and then you, all you need to do for your unit testing in Jenkins, you say, uh, I would run, or like to run my UTPL SQL version 3, and produce the J unit reports, or X unit reports. And then all you need to do is just say, okay, now consume the X unit, X unit reports. So there okay. is no need for a plugin, like for... For version two, you had to use plugin because it wasn't you, you couldn't just call it from from Jenkins directly. And now okay, you can fine. call it from from command line. Perfect. Here's another question. It was a great session. How do we install these suites and set them up? And where can we get the PowerPoint used for this session? So, in terms of getting the PowerPoint and the recording, you will get an email from Odie Tug with the information. You can also check my Twitter account. I'll post links to them as well. Uh, in terms of how do you install these suites and set them up? I think I can speak for Pavel and Yasek to say, go to the GitHub repository and then download UTPL SQL and step through the, the instructions. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Do PL SQL unit testers move code to private packages to expose more modules to unit testing? I th think what this question is, Doug, and you can uh, clarify me if this is not right, is if you have private subprograms and packages that you want to test, do you move them into these so-called private packages, which aren't really private, into the specification so that you can test them? That's a difficult question, and I, I would say it depends, as mm -hmm. usual. Um, there are many practices that people use, and, and I know some of them are exposing the private procedures as public. And then you kind of end up in, you might end up in a situation where in production you actually expose private procedures as public and you kind of lose control what's private, what's public, what, what is being used, what's not being used. Uh, so... There are two things uh, I, I suggest in this area. One is you can use conditional compilation to expose them or hide them in your package spec. And that should work pretty well. But the other thing is that in, in 12C, we have a feature called whitelisting. So you could actually create a package that exposes those private, what should be private subprograms in a separate package spec, but they can only be called by the testing package or by the production code that's supposed to use it. So there are a number of techniques available in PL SQL that allow you to pretty safely expose what should be completely private. Uh, and do check out the whitelisting. It's called accessible by clause. I have a question here of, UTPL SQL or SQL developer, I assume what you're asking Rajiv is, which one should you use? I suggest you check them both out. The advantage of SQL developer's unit testing framework is that it comes in, out of the box integrated in SQL developer. And also, you don't write any code at all. Uh, Pavel was showing you some of the code you write using the assertion APIs, or not the assertion API, the expect API. 
The idea behind SQL developers, you simply say, I expect this to happen when I pass in these parameters, and it generates all the code, actually Java code, that is then used to run against the framework. And that's also what Quest Code Tester or Code Tester for Oracle does. So the, the big difference between something like UTPL SQL and the IDE-based frameworks is that they will generate the test code for you. The trade-off is generally that you, you lose some control. So SQL developer is fairly limited in what kind of test you can build out of the box. Code Tester is more expansive, but it also comes with a, a fee. It's, it's not a free tool. Uh, UTPL SQL gives you full control. And with version three in the annotations, it really does a lot of the work for you. It's, it's quite nice. And I'm pretty sure it will get better because remember, it's just the first release of the version three. And we already have like plenty of ideas of how to improve it even more, you know, do even more features to it. And the questions keep rolling and we'll go for it max five more minutes and then we'll, we'll turn this off. Is it a good bad practice to have all the setup and teardown procedures in a separate shared package? What do you think? Um, with, the, with version three, you can define several layers or several stages of preparation. Uh, it's uh, before the whole suite preparation. So it's executed once and everything is set up and all the procedures executed afterwards. You can execute, bef you can define before each test procedure. So it will be executed and make all the preparations before each step, before each test is executed, and also you can have a, a special for the test before test before test preparation procedure. So it's like private preparation for the test. Uh, why it is why it is recommended to separate preparations from the test uh, is that if something wrong happened, like an exception, an uh, unhandled exception, in a preparation step, it doesn't mean that your test is wrong. It means that your preparation is wrong and you can say nothing about your test. So you can distinguish between these two uh, failures. And this way, uh, the framework uh, gathers all, all, all the, not gathers, like uh, it takes, uh, it takes uh, responsible, it is responsible for the transaction control and all the stuff that has to be cleaned up after your test execution. Question and, for Steph. Just, oh, sorry. Ah, sorry. Oh. And just to add on top of that, I think, you know, maybe it was a, because I understood the question a little bit differently. Should you put all of your setup into a, like, common package that handles right. all the setups, right? So kind of separate the setup things from the test things. And again, it's kind of depends, but I would, I actually think that it is a good practice to have maybe to avoid having too much code in one package when, when those, those setups could, could grow quite, quite large, maybe get some common procedures or common functionality for doing a setup per table because usually the setup is related to data setup, right? So, mm -hmm. so maybe have a setup for this table, setup for this table uh, as a shareable and reusable code. And the more you can reuse, the less you write, and the less you write, the the cheaper the software gets. So it's easier to change. So I usually. I usually don't have uh, something to tear down. Um, usually the, the test you want to execute is responsible that everything is like this, the test needs. So in, in my cases, always this, the, the, the setup is the most important thing. Yeah? We are doing the inserts and the source tables and so on. And, and tear down, I don't care because the next test the next test will clean up everything because he needs this test needs to clean up yeah the setup yeah so tear down I, w I wouldn't do anything in the tear down mm. two more two more questions then we're going to close the session one is for the the UTPL SQL v3 guys can you define a sequence in which the different test suites execute and then second for Stefan are you is your Excel tool using version two or version three Okay, uh, for the version three, for the version three, currently all the tests are executed in the order they are defined. Uh, but uh, we will, we are going to introduce something like a shuffle mechanism, so that the tests are executed uh, in a random order. So there is uh, no dependency between the test execution, which is very important in a unit testing. Right, but I think the question was a little bit different. So. I have 16 packages. They all say dash dash percent suite. In what order will those different suites be run? Uh, specify in order to those suites. Not within the suite, but 
across yeah, the street. Yeah, I see, I see. Uh, if the suites are independent between each other, because we have a concept of a nested suite, when you have a suite that has test and also child suite, and test and child suite, etc., and you have this kind of complex preparation and cleanup up for all of them, uh, if they are not structured this way, if they are uh, on a sem similar level, uh, then there is no predefined order of how they will be executed. And so if they are specify. executed... Hmm? You can't currently specify an order. No, but uh, no, you cannot. And there is no order for them because they are all independent. Okay. And Stefan, your Excel tool, version 2, version 3? It's version 2 at the moment, yeah. <laughs> I, I know uh, YouTube PLSQL 3 uh, for, yeah, it's for for two months now that it's, it's existing and uh, the guys are working on it. And I'm using the Excel for now five years, and, or no, more, uh, eight years. And it's, uh, yeah, that was YouTube PLSQL version 2. Yeah. All right. Well, that uses up our time and more. Thank you all of you for presenting. Thanks for our attendees for sticking by. Hopefully that was a useful and interesting session on unit testing and you're inspired to check out UTPL SQL version 3 using Excel with UTPL SQL or any other unit testing framework. The main thing is to do more testing. Thanks, everybody, and looking forward Thanks. to the next talk session. Thank Follow you so me. much. <laughs> Thank you, gentlemen. <General. laughs> right.